So this talk is called Abide and Thrive. So I'm going to look at some of the ways that we can stay close to the Lord. So he said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who lives in me and I in him will produce abundantly, for apart from me you can do nothing. So apart from God, we can't do anything. So we really do need God. And a life without prayer is like a lamp that is unplugged. You can have a good bulb, and you can be a beautiful lamp. But if you aren't plugged in, you're not going to do what you're supposed to do. You can't fulfill your true purpose. And it's the same with us. Prayer keeps us plugged into the source of life. Without God's life flowing through us, we can't be the person that we were created to be. And the source of that life flowing through us is the Holy Spirit. So we're talking about the Holy Spirit today. When we give the Holy Spirit total permission to work in our life, when we surrender everything, we don't just survive, but we thrive. There's a good format for prayer. I heard this a long time ago. It still works. It's called ACTS. Is it up there? Not yet. A-C-T-S. So adore, confess, thanksgiving, and supplication. So first we, <clears throat> first we praise God for who he is. Next we confess any wrongdoing. Then we thank him for many blessings. And finally, we ask him for what we need. Often after the first three, we don't feel like we need to ask him anything because we've just been with God. And God knows our needs better than we do. So it works really well. We do need to pray intercessory prayers for others. It's good and holy, but that should never be our full prayer time, just asking, you know. So praising God is huge. It brings us right into God's presence. One of the first spiritual books that I read that had a really big impact on my life was called Prison to Praise. Anybody ever read that? Merlin Carruthers, fantastic out of print book now, but it is a really good book. And through that book, I learned that we can choose to praise God no matter what. I can't hold this thing. It's going back. Okay. When we choose to praise God no matter what, he is set free to work in our circumstances. When we immerse ourselves in God's presence through praise, nothing can disturb us. Even if things don't change, we're better off because we're with God, and he will help us go through it. Prayers of praise focus on who God is like this. Praise you, Lord. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Praise you, Jesus. You are the Savior of the world. You died so I could live. Praise you, Jesus. You are the light of the world, the Prince of peace, the true vine. You are my hiding place, my shelter, and my high tower. Thank you for being the same yesterday, today, and forever. Psalm 104 says this, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Notice it doesn't say that we get in by complaining. That's not how we get in to see God. Our, he inhabits the praises of his people. So as we praise God, we're just drawn into the throne room of God, and we're with him. Praise opens our hearts to all that God wants to give us. It softens us, and it makes us more able to hear the Holy Spirit teaching us. <clears throat> Sorry. Praise takes our minds off of ourselves and puts them on our almighty God. I made a bookmark. I don't know if you all got them, but they're on the table. And it's just, praise you, Lord, and it has all these names of God. So it help, helps us to jumpstart that praising. So grab one. They're free, and they're here for you. When I first read Prison of Praise, the idea of praising God in all things was a real stretch for me. At that time, I was so focused on the negative, and I always imagined the worst. I didn't know I could live differently. It took time and practice, but I learned to praise God in all things. You don't praise him for the bad things. You simply choose to praise him no matter what because he is worthy of our praise. You praise God because he is trustworthy and because he loves us unconditionally, because he is holy, mighty, awesome God, and he alone deserves our praise. So when something goes wrong, you tell the Lord about it, 
and you share with him, and then you pray something like this. Lord, I thank you that you are in control, even though it doesn't look like it. I thank you for working all things for good. I choose today to claim that promise in this situation, and I believe that you will bring good out of it. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. Thank you for preparing a place for me in heaven. I love you, Lord. Amen. So Father took my best scripture verse, but it can be all of our best scripture verse. It's Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. All things can work for good, like losing your job, yes, like getting cancer, yes, like having to move far away from your family, yes, like COVID-19, yes. All things can work for good. This verse has been foundational in my life. But lately, I've been praying it a lot more and claiming the truth of it for our family. Our family has always been very close. We actually followed our oldest son, oldest sons, both of them, to Oregon 19 years ago. And then we moved again to Washington four years ago so that we could live near each other and be a part of our grandkids' lives. And that was, that's huge to move once you get to 50 and 65, to pick up and move. It's hard. You gotta find a dentist. You gotta find all these new things. And you leave your faith community, so it's hard. But it's been worth it because we get to be a part of our kids and our grandkids' daily lives. It's fantastic. We even live on the same property as our oldest son, so our four grandkids are right there. It's fantastic. And it's been wonderful to share weekly family dinners, going to the kids' games, and being able to, being able to help them when they need us. But we are actually in the middle of a big crisis, and this crisis can tear families apart. For now, our family needs space to heal so Jim and I plan on taking an extended trip to make that space for them. It was really difficult in the beginning because I didn't understand. And of course I wanted to fix it because I'm the mom. But God kept telling me, and he keeps telling me, to be still and let him take care of it. We love our family so much, we will do anything to bring healing back. Some days I feel like my heart is broken, and I'm sure the others feel the same or worse. But God has allowed this horrible thing to happen, and we trust that in his time it's gonna work out. We will do whatever we can so that it doesn't divide us for good. The Holy Spirit reminded me of this verse in Isaiah. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my ways above your ways, my thoughts above your thoughts. Even though with human eyes it doesn't make sense, it makes sense to God. And that needs to be enough for me. As we continue to go through this trial, we cling to God's promises and hang on to hope. We pray and sacrifice for our family, offering up our pain and believing that God just won't work it out but he will bring so much good for it. And healing restores relationships. God will get the glory. Sometimes when I go to adoration, I take my journal and I ask the Lord to speak to me. And then I just start writing. And this is what I wrote the other day. Oh, my daughter, truly you cannot understand my ways or my thoughts, but you can rest in me and let me do what needs to be done. You know that I love your family more than you do. And you know that I have created each of you for a purpose. It is all unfolding as it should. They are being tried in fire and strengthened and purified, as are you. Trust me, little one. Rest in my love. Rest near my heart. Let me carry, carry you. It'll come back. 
You don't need to understand. Trust me. Stay close. Praise me and keep lifting your family up to me. Sacrifice for them. Love them and let them go. I am in control and I love you. One of the hardest parts of a trial is not to let our feelings take over like mine just did. <laughs> it's especially hard for me because I have a tendency to let my feelings dictate how my day goes. But feelings aren't facts and they aren't right or wrong, they just are. I don't like to feel sad or mad or broken, so it's easier for me to just pretend everything is fine and try to ignore those feelings. But now I'm trying to think it, feel it, and let it go. Which leads us to a great truth. We as Christians are to walk by faith, not by sight. So it's not what I see that's true. It's that I know that God is God and he's going to work it out. So even though things look dreary and difficult and wrong, God is still loving us. He is still there for us and we can lean on him even when we don't feel his presence. Just like love. We don't always feel love, but we choose to love. We can find scripture verses that help us stay focused on the truth, like what Satan meant for harm, God meant for good. This too shall pass, and the Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. Many of the Psalms are a great comfort when things are hard. We always have a choice. We can focus on the problem or on God. I love this quote from Jesus Calling. Be on guard against self-pity, self-preoccupation, and giving up. You have a continual choice, deep dependence on me or despair. The emptiness inside you will be filled either with problems or with my presence, end quote. And this reminds me of another great quote. Don't tell people how big your problem is. Tell your problem how big your God is. Amen. Another thing that helps us abide and thrive is listening to great Christian music like we've had all day today. Music touches us in a way that nothing else does, and it is so important in our spiritual life. It actually changes the atmosphere around us. That is the truth. If you're having a bad day, crank up the praise music and the Everything changes because praise and worship, like I said, it brings us into God's presence. And we're like with the angels and saints praising him. We're with him. And it makes a huge difference. The battle belongs to the Lord. And our job is to trust him. I love the end of the chaplet of divine mercy where it says that in difficult moments we might not despair nor become despondent but with great confidence to admit ourselves to your holy will, which is love and mercy itself. Amen. Whatever you are going through, God is with you. All of us have suffering in our lives, but we are not alone in that suffering. Plus, we can offer it up for the good of others. Please don't waste your suffering. When you are hurting, whether physically or emotionally, you can offer it up for somebody else. Even little inconveniences and annoyances can be offered up. I remember my mom when I was a kid, she always said, offer it up. And we would say, all for thee, dear Jesus. And we all did it obediently. And I didn't get it when I did it back then, but boy, do I get it now. I appreciate it now. There is so much power when we pray for others while we are in pain or distress. Redemptive suffering unites our suffering with Jesus on the cross and can have eternal consequences for someone else's salvation if you offer it up for them. So often pain and suffering seems useless, but in fact, they are a powerhouse for prayer. And always remember, the sufferings of the present are nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. We can't abide and thrive if we're regretting the past or worrying about the future. Father Jacques Philippe says, we must remain in the present moment to receive God's love, entrusting our past to God's infinite mercy and putting our future in the hands of his providence. Living in the moment is the only place that God is. 
When I recognize that each moment is a gift from God, I can cultivate a heart of thanksgiving. I can be glad that I'm alive, that I can see and walk and talk and hear. I can choose to have an attitude of gratitude. And having a thankful heart lifts our spirits and gives us joy. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. We need it. We are God's beloved daughters, and as we cherish the moments of each day, we become joyful, praising, thankful women, and our joy will overflow into all areas of our lives and into the lives of those around us. It's so important that we control our thoughts, too. I talked about our feelings, but often it's our thoughts that bring those feelings. So we need to look back at, what am I thinking? We really need to stop the negative things that often come unbidden into our heads, that negative stuff that just jumps in there. And we can't dwell on that. We have to stop and realize what we're thinking about. So are we letting ourselves dwell on something we can't change? Are we reliving an argument that we had? Do we keep thinking of what that person said or did that hurt me? We're only hurting ourselves when we dwell in the past or things that upset us. We can replace those thoughts again with God's word or with a song. Just stop and speak God's word into your situation or sing a song out loud. Take every thought captive and ask the Holy Spirit to help you change the negative ones. Fill your mind instead with thanksgiving. Think of who God is and his rich blessings for your life and praise him. There is always something that we can be thankful for. Is it up there? I love that. Like in the movie, you guys know Pollyanna? It's one of my favorite movies. She played the glad game. So whenever others were complaining about things, she found something that we could be grateful for, that she could be grateful for. And the pastor in the movie finally won over by her joy, found 365 glad verses in the Bible, one for each day of the year, like these. Rejoice and be glad. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Weeping may come in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And your love has given me great joy and encouragement. Even when our world is falling apart, maybe especially when our world is falling apart, we can thank God for this beautiful world that he made. We can thank Jesus for dying on the cross to make a way for us to go to heaven one day. And we can rejoice that the Holy Spirit indwells us and is available to us every moment of every day. Besides our thoughts and feelings, it's also important to control what we say. When we say things like, I will never be able to do that, or it's never going to work out, we're speaking our own future. Our words matter. Say instead, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and God has given me a future and a hope. Learning to speak positively instead of negatively is a game changer. Everything improves when you focus on what you can do instead of what you can't do and what you have instead of what you don't have. The words we speak about other people matters too, matter too. When our oldest son was in college, poor John, he's all my stories, he began to drink heavily, drink heavily. I was very, very worried about him and I would say things like this, I'm afraid he's gonna hurt somebody when he's drunk. He was a big, strong kid and he had anger in him that would, it was pretty scary when he got mad. Or I would say, I'm afraid he's going to land in jail. Then I read a book by the person Father mentioned, Joyce Meyer, called Me and My Big Mouth. Great book, but when you hand it to your friend, she might look at you funny. <laughs> She's like, wait, you think I need this? Well, I shared it because it's such a good book. But in that book, what I learned was that my words about John mattered. So I quit saying those things about him. And I started saying this, John is going to become the man God created him to be. John has a firm foundation and he will land on his faith. John is a wonderful man of God. And then I looked for scriptures and I found where I could put his name in like Daniel 341. Now John follows you with his whole heart. He fears you and prays to you. Matthew 12, 18, here's my servant whom I have chosen, my loved one in whom I delight. I will endow John with my spirit. That's a good one. I had a whole page of these scriptures, and I prayed them for him every day. God's word is so powerful, John's life started changing. It was truly amazing to watch as over time those scriptures 
I prayed for him came true in his life. He's the father of four himself today, and he is a man of God, and I'm so proud of him. Yeah. So we know that God's word teaches us the importance of forgiveness. Matthew 6, 14, 15 says, you all know this one, for if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Our two oldest boys, so now Jerry gets to be in one story, had a big fight over a girl when the oldest one was home for a visit from college. Our second son, Jerry, told me that he hated his brother and he would never forgive him for what happened. While I agreed with him that what his brother had done was wrong, I told him, Jerry, this is a test. It was a chance for him to do what God asks us to do. I reminded him that God tells us unless we forgive our brother, he won't forgive us when we need it. I asked him to pray about that, and then I went to talk to his brother, John. I told him how badly he had hurt his brother and asked him if he was willing to apologize to him. He said he had made a big mistake and he wanted to apologize, but he was afraid that Jerry would never forgive him. He was right. That's how Jerry felt. But he said, I will tell him. So I went and got Jerry. And I said that John wanted to talk to him. As the two came together, they were over here and I'm over here. And I'm like praying like this, Jesus, help these boys, you know, come Holy Spirit. Quietly, they didn't hear me. But they came together. John started crying. He said how sorry he was. Jerry hugged his older brother and said he forgave him. As they were hugging and crying, I too was crying and thanking God for showing us how to let him help us with practical problems. Later that afternoon, John left to go back to college, and we all went to Mass that night. Jerry came to me after Mass and shared the rest of the story. He said that although he had mouthed those words to John, that he forgave him, he didn't feel like it. He still felt that he hated him, and he would never forgive him. And then we went to Mass. He said, but during Mass, God touched him and took away that hatred that he was feeling. And he said, Mom... It really works when you're willing to be obedient and do it God's way. How amazing is that? That's the beauty of our faith and the beauty of God himself. His ways are not our ways, but they are the best ways. Think about this definition of unforgiveness. Drinking poison, hoping to hurt the other person. Let me repeat that. We drink poison, hoping to hurt the other person. We only hurt ourselves when we're not willing to forgive. Conversely, I like this definition of forgiveness, giving up all hope for a better past. Lily Tomlin said that. We can't change the past, but we can change how we look at things that happened to us or that were painful or degrading. We can let go of the bad feelings and replace them with thanksgiving. Forgiveness sets us free and gives us a bright new beginning each day. Unforgiveness ties us to the past and keeps us bound up in the sorrow and pain that we reinflict upon ourselves when we dwell on injustices done to us or our loved ones. Wow, this is a jump. The next page says, so how do we thrive in our marriages? Moving right along from forgiveness. We need forgiveness in our marriages too, don't we? There's so much expert advice out there. I just want to share a couple things that have helped Jim and I along the way. A friend shared with us early on in our marriage to touch the host to our wedding bands whenever we receive Holy Communion. I love that. It's not magic, but it reminds me to pray for Jim and Jim to pray for me and for the two of us to invite God to be the center of our marriage, the glue that holds us together. And we've been praying that now for probably 40 years, and I believe those prayers have helped us a lot. Surely challenges come. Challenges come to every marriage. Staying together takes communication and compromise, and the, he compromises. <laughs> and the willingness to forgive and being able to laugh at ourselves. One of my little trials is trying to sleep when Jim snores. Well, he doesn't really snore. 
he does this thing I call Darth Vader breathing. <sighs> and it keeps me awake. Well, so one night I made up a little song to sing. Thank you, God, that Jim's still breathing. I'm so glad that he's alive. Even though his snoring keeps me wide awake at 3.05. <laughs> Praise you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, help me now. Offer up this inconvenience. Be true to my wedding vows. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> And I added, I added a little bit to our original vows. For better or for worse, in thickening and thinning, my waist, his hairline. In hot flashes and in memory loss, I will love you and honor you days of my life. <sighs> He's great. From movies and books, I think we get the notion that her spouse will complete us. Who said that? Jerry Maguire, somebody said that. But that's not true. Our spouse compliments us. Only God can complete us. So you've probably seen this, but imagine a triangle. God's at the top, you and your spouse are here. At the, here's the triangle. The closer each one of us travels to God, the closer we get to God, the closer we are to each other. So we each need to get close to God, and that really builds up our marriage, and it's a beautiful thing we can do. We have to work at it. Marriage is not like a walk in the park. Well, we walk in the park, but it can be really hard sometimes. And don't go to bed angry, ever. You might have to stay up pretty late, but don't go to bed angry, okay? That's really important. Another thing that I think really helps us thrive down here is the hope of heaven. You guys, some days I can't wait. I can't wait to get to heaven and explore. We are alive in these human bodies, but there is so much awaiting us in heaven. Incorruptible bodies, it's going to be incredible. I know my finite mind can't even imagine what it would be like, but it's so fun to try. Here's what we can say. We can say, I hope I'll go to heaven, or heaven is my hope. See the difference? The first one, you're just hoping you're going to make it, and the second one, you know when you die, you're going to go to heaven. You may stop in purgatory on the way. That's way okay. You're still going to make it. But we are God's beloved daughters, and he is telling us, I can't wait for you to come home and see the place I have prepared for you from all time. I can't wait to see you face to face. It's so awesome that we have the blessed assurance that heaven is our hope. And knowing our future is in heaven where there are no more tears and no more suffering helps keep everything else we go through in perspective. St. Bernard of Clairvaux said, what does it matter in the light of eternity? Truly, we can live by those words every day we think about. Does it really matter in the whole big picture? We have three sons and one daughter, which you may have saw in the picture. And don't you know, the Lord called our one daughter to religious life. I said, come on, Lord, can't you count? Three boys, one girl. Hello, take one of these to be a priest. <laughs> no, that wasn't his plan. She moved to New York and entered the Sisters of Life 12 years ago. Truly, what a blessing to have her say yes to God and live for him and in service to our church. But we only get to see her twice a year, if we're lucky, and talk to her once a month for 45 minutes. No emailing, no texting. We miss her terribly. All she ever wanted to do was get married and have kids and live next door. And that was our plan, is she would live next door. She and I would lead retreats together, because this is what we do. And that would be, we would sing at mass together, and we would all live happily ever after, right? Wrong. <laughs> well, we are living happily ever after, but she's not next door. So God's plan is always better than our plan, and we are incredibly blessed by her vocation and really happy for her. And I, I know it could be a lot worse. 
She could be unhappily married, living far away. She could be homeless on the street. She could be in the military in danger every day. Or she could have already died. And I'm so sorry if any of you have had a child precede you in death. I can't imagine your pain. The truth is, we all have our crosses. And we can't compare them. But for everyone, Jesus wants to help us carry that cross. And for me, one of the ways he has helped me when I really miss her is to remind me that we will have all eternity running around heaven exploring. That's probably why I can't wait to get there. I'm pretty sure we've all wondered what heaven will be like. When I think about heaven, I first think of all the people I will see again. My mom, my dad, my sister who died when I was 13, my grandparents, aunts, uncles, all the great someone before them. A friend shared with me that when her mom was getting close to death, she was looking up in the corner of her room and her eyes lit up and she said she saw what looked like a fence. And her mother was jumping up, peeking over the fence saying, she's coming, she's coming. I love to think of the family reunions and parties that go on anytime someone dies. It is so consoling to realize that those who have suffered so much are not suffering anymore. Our friends who have never walked are now running and jumping. And friends who are blind can now see for the first time. I think heaven is a really crazy, happy place. I think of meeting Pope John XXIII. He is one of my heroes of the faith. St. Francis of Assisi, St. Clair, so many people who are at this very moment praying for us and cheering us on to the finish line. A cool thing happened the year I was praying for our daughter as she was preparing for her final vows. The Holy Spirit said, you know, you've asked lots of people to pray for Sister Cecilia Rose all these nine years that she's been in the convent. Why don't you ask the people you know in heaven too? What a fun idea. So I started thinking of all those who have gone before me. I would think of someone say their name and ask, would you please pray for Julie as she prepares for her final vows? It was an awesome experience. I felt like I was in heaven walking around, finding our friends and finding the saints who are part of her journey and our pastors who are already in heaven. I wrote down each name as I asked them to pray for her. And then I sent that list to her, explaining how even people in heaven were praying for her. Actually, they probably were already praying for her, but it was fun for me as her mom to ask them and to say hi. The veil between here and there is really thin sometimes. There's a book called Imagine Heaven that gave me, as Anne of Green Gables would say, more scope for my imagination regarding heaven. The author, John Burke, collected stories from people who had had near-death experiences and looked at what they saw in the light of scripture. The only objections I've heard about the book is that he doesn't talk about purgatory, but it really is still a good read. He studied over a thousand stories and felt he had to share them. He said people can't imagine heaven, so they don't live for it. Are we living for heaven? Are we longing for heaven? Don Piper, who wrote 90 Minutes in Heaven, which is also a great book, wrote the foreword for this book and said, Experience in heaven is the most real thing that's ever happened to me. I did not want to come back. If you've been there, you don't want to be here. <laughs> And let me quote what one person saw. The gathering included millions and millions of angels and people in an expanse that looked like the ocean. Waves of people moving in the light, swaying to the music, worshiping God. Somehow the music in heaven calibrated everything. Music was everywhere. The worship of God was the heart and focus of the music, and I never wanted it to end. Some days I can hardly wait to start exploring heaven, but for now, I'm going to let the hope of heaven encourage me and help me stay the course down here. Well, a couple little notes just about the idea of simplicity. It's so easy for our lives to be too busy, for our bodies to be overworked, and our calendars to be overbooked. Maybe it's time to simplify. There's a book called A Place Called Simplicity by Claire Cloninger. The author suggests we were created for something very different than this craziness, something, quote, simple and sensible and lovely and right. I love that. Simple, sensible, lovely, and right. 
One of her main suggestions is to limit our options, which we can do in any area of our lives. We can give away clothing we haven't worn for a year. Well, how do you do that? Put everything inside out on the hangers, and a year later, if something is still inside out, you didn't wear it. It goes out the door. Another thing you can do is when you buy a new shirt, give away a different one. So keep moving things out. Don't, don't let it keep piling up. A cleaning expert found that clutter is one of the biggest reasons for personal unhappiness in this country. Keep what you need, the essential, and the highly treasured, the significant, and sell or give away the rest. The author says it isn't easy, but it's liberating. She found she was trading her possessions for space, not only physical space, but spiritual and emotional space. Decluttering brings a peace and serenity and simplicity that makes parting with things possible. We can also cut back our activities if we have too many so that we have time for our families and those most important to us, and that includes God. Quoting from the book, voluntary simplicity is choosing to live more frugally on the material side of life so that we can live more abundantly on that spiritual side of life. Isn't that a great quote? When we pare down our possessions, activities, and relationships, we can focus better on what remains. Terry Young sums it up in this Jesus Calling quote. When something comes to your attention, ask me whether or not it is part of today's agenda. If it isn't, release it into my care and go on about today's duties. When you follow this practice, there will be beautiful simplicity in your life. A time for everything and everything in its time. A life lived close to me is not complicated or cluttered. When you focus on my presence, many things that once troubled you lose their power over you. Amen to that. I want to end this talk with a quote from Henry Nouwen. Prayer is listening to the voice that calls us, my beloved May we all take time to let God love us every day. Thank you.